I'd like to thank Mary for inviting me here tonight. I, uh, I spend a good deal of time hiking the trails up in these hills here, and uh, it's fun to be here and share a story with you tonight. Before there was anything, before the great flood had covered the earth and receded, before the animals walked the earth, or the trees covered the land, or the birds flew in between the trees, even before the fish and whales and seals swam in the sea. An old man lived. There's always an old man in the story. But well, this old man lived in a house on the bank of a river with his only child, a daughter. They lived together there in complete and utter darkness. Because at that time, the whole world was dark inky, pitchy, all-consuming dark, blacker than a thousand stormy winter midnights, blacker than anything anywhere has been since. And the reason for all this blackness has to do with the old man in the house by the river, who had a box, which contained a box, which contained a box, which contained an infinite number of boxes each one nestled inside a box just slightly larger than itself until finally there was a box so small that all it could contain was all the light in the universe. Now the raven, who of course existed at that time because the raven had always existed and always would, was somewhat less than satisfied with this state of affairs since it led to an awful lot of blundering around and bumping into things. And it slowed him down a good deal in his pursuit of food, other fleshly pleasures, and in his constant efforts to interfere and change things. Now eventually all this bumbling around in the dark led him close to the home of the old man. He first heard a little sing-song voice muttering away. And when he followed the sound of the voice, he came to the wall of the house, and there he placed his ear against the planking, and he could just make out the words. I have a box, and inside the box is another box, and inside that box are many more boxes, and in the smallest box of all, it's all the light in the world, and it's all mine, and I'll never give any of it to anyone, not even to my daughter. Hearing this, it took only an instant for the raven to decide to steal that light for himself. But it took him a lot longer to invent a way of doing so. First, he had to find a door into the house. But no matter, no matter how many times he circled it, or how carefully he felt the planking, it remained a smooth, unbroken <laughs> barrier. Sometimes he heard the old man or his daughter leave the house to fetch water or for some other reason, but always they departed from the side of the house opposite to where he was. And when he ran around to the other side, the wall seemed as unbroken as ever. Finally, he decided to, the raven, he decided to retire upstream a little ways, and, and he thought and thought about how he could enter the house. In doing so, he began to think more and more about the, the young girl who lived there. And thinking of her, he began to stir more than just the raven's imagination. She could be as, as ugly as a sea slug, but on the other hand, she could be as lovely as the fronds of the hemlock would be against a bright spring sunrise. If only there were enough light to make a sunrise. And in that thought, he found a solution to his problem. And so, he waited for the young girl, whose footsteps he could now distinguish between those of her father's, for her to come to the river to gather water. And when she did, he changed himself into a single hemlock needle. Now, for those of you who don't know what a hemlock is, it's a pine tree, and it's a little pine tree. He changed himself into one of these, dropped into the river, 
and floated down just in time to be scooped up in the basket that the girl was just dipping into the river. Now, even in his much diminished form, the raven was able to make at least a very small magic, just enough to make the girl so thirsty that she took a long, deep drink from the basket. And in doing so, she swallowed the needle. Now the raven slithered down deep into her warm insides and found a nice, comfortable spot where he transformed himself once again, this time into a very small human being, where he stayed and went to sleep for a long while. And while he slept, he grew. And now the young girl didn't have any idea what was happening to her, and she didn't, of course, tell her father, who noticed nothing unusual because it was so dark. But after a while, he did become aware of a new presence in the household as the raven finally emerged triumphantly in the shape of a human boy child. Now he was, well, he would have been, if anyone could have seen him, a very strange looking boy with a long beak-like nose and a few feathers here and there. He had the shining eyes of the raven, which would have given his face a bright, inquisitive appearance if anyone could have seen these features then. And he was noisy. He had a cry which contained all the noises of an, of an angry raven and a spoiled child he makes. Yet, he could sometimes speak as softly as the wind in the boughs of the hemlock with an echo of that beautiful other sound, like an organic bell, which is also a part of every rate of speech. At times like these, his grandfather grew to love this strange new member of his household, and he spent many hours playing with him, making him toys and inventing games for him. As he gained more and more of the old man's affection and confidence, Ravenchild began to feel more intently around the house, trying to find where that light was hidden. After much exploration, he concluded that, he, that they had it hidden in the big box in the corner of the house. And so one day, Raven cautiously opened the lid. Now, of course, he could see nothing. And all he could feel was another box. His grandfather, however, heard his precious treasure chest being disturbed and dealt very harshly with the would-be thief, threatening dire punishment if that raven child was to ever touch that box again. Well, this elicited a, a tidal wave of noisy protests from the raven, <laughs> coupled with tender importunings during which the raven never mentioned the light, but only pleaded for the largest box. That box, he told his grandfather, was the one thing he needed to, to make himself completely happy. He just had to have it. Well, as most, if not all, grandfathers have done since the beginning, the old man finally yielded and he gave his grandson the outermost box. Now this contented the boy for a time, but as most, if not all, grandchildren have done since the beginning, the raven child soon demanded the next box. Now it took many days and much cajoling, with lots of well-planned tantrums, but one by one the boxes were removed. And when only a few were left, a strange radiance, never before seen, began to infuse the darkness of the house, disclosing vague shapes and their shadows, still too dim to have any definite form. 
And then one day, the raven child pleaded in his most pitiful voice of all to be allowed to hold the light for just a moment. Now, this request was instantly refused. But of course, in time, his grandfather yielded. And so it was that one day, from the final box, the old man lifted the light in the form of a beautiful incandescent ball and tossed it to his grandson. Now he caught only a brief glimpse of this child on whom he had lavished such love and affection. For even as the light was traveling toward him, the raven, the child, turned back into the form of a huge black shadow, wings wide spread, beak wide open, and waiting. The raven snapped up the light in his beak, thrust his great wings downward, and shot up through the smoke hole of the house, out into the huge darkness of the world. That world was instantly transformed. Mountains and valleys were starkly silhouetted. The river sparkled with broken reflections, and everywhere life began to stir anew. And from far away, another great winged creature lifted itself into the air, as light entered the eyes of the eagle for the first time and showed him his prey. Now the raven flew along, rejoicing in his wonderful new possession, admiring the effect it had on the world below, and reveling in the experience of being able to see where he was going instead of flying blindly, hoping for the best. In fact, he was having such a good time that he never saw the eagle until the eagle was nearly upon him. In a panic, he swerved to, to escape those savage, outstretched claws. And in doing so, he dropped a good half of the light he was carrying. It fell to the rocky ground below and it broke into pieces. One large piece and too many small ones to count. And then they bounced back up into the sky. They remain there even today. They are the moon and the stars that glorify the night. Now the eagle continued to pursue the raven out beyond the rim of the world, where the raven at last, exhausted by the long chase, let go of his last piece of light. And so there it hovered on the clouds until it began to climb up over the mountains lying to the east. Its first rays caught the smoke hole of the house by the river, where the old man wept bitterly over the loss of his precious light and the treachery of his grandson. But as the light entered into the house, the old man looked up and for the first time saw his daughter who had been sitting quietly through all of this, completely overwhelmed with the chain of events. And so the old man and his daughter beheld at last the beauty of the world, ablaze with life, and they were happy. That's the raven steals the light. Thank you. That's an old Haida tale. It's a tribe of uh, natives from the Pacific Northwest. Our next teller is Cindy.